Welcome to Through Theology in a Year. I'm Michael Patton, and this is Theology Unplugged, our podcast. So it's it's a slight bit confusing for some of you guys, but listen, we're coming through on YouTube, we're coming through on your Spotify, maybe later on in the day, or wherever you get your podcasts, but it is called Theology Unplugged, and probably whenever you search on YouTube for Theology Unplugged, this ought to come up. However, it may not. Look for Credo House. That is our channel on YouTube. It's Credo House. So go there and uh, if you want to join us live. But we are on our ninth session, and this is still folk theology. And I'm really excited because <laughs> I think we're going to finish the folk theology today. I think. I'm not promising anything. I don't know how we're going to get through this in a year. I really don't. I mean through theology in a year and I'm on my ninth session and I can't get through just folk theology but it's so exciting and let me tell you something this is so important the reason why honestly it's not just because I'm I'm being irresponsible with my time it's because this is such an important part of the entirety of through theology in a year and if you came in late let's say you were on session number 300 I'll probably tell you, hey, go back to this session. At least go back to the first 20 sessions and listen to those first because you want to understand how we're doing this in our methodology. This, The way I go through this, this is part of what's called the Introduction to Theology class of the theology program. You can find that in its entirety, 60 sessions already recorded in a formal way. Now, it's 20 years ago, and I was a lot younger then, but um, it's it's the same thing. It's the same content. I've changed it around. I'm updating it right now, and I'm going through it all again. But you can get that at Credo Courses. If you search at credocourses.com, search for the theology program, you can get a little, little right here. You can get this. This thing right here, and it'll be the entirety of all that we have on a 256 gigabyte hard drive. That's the best way to get it. But we've been—I've been doing this for a long time. I've been teaching this class for a long time, and I'm just my—I'm trying to convince you right now that this is very important what we're doing here. And I—you I, hear me a lot wherever I teach, wherever I say anything. I will talk about prolegomena. The prologue to the book of theology. You've got to read it. This is so important. And this is what we're doing here. We're in the prologue. Uh, most of the time I write, I write books. Uh, here's a book right here. And I've got the prologue. I know people don't read it, so I don't put much in this prologue. So prologues we usually don't read. But we have to read the prologue to theology so that we can have a methodology that makes sense. If we do not have a methodology that makes sense, we're going to be far down the road and we're going to be stuck in some ways that we don't even know why we're stuck in them. It's just because somebody else has done it. I'm trying to teach you how we're we're trying to teach you how to do theology. Now, in folk theology, and one thing real quick, and I've got, I've got my book at the bottom, uh, if you're looking in the comments, I've also got this book. This is Jim Sawyer's Survivor's Guide to Theology. This guy's a really good friend. I mean, just great, great guy. So much fun. But, and hey, Jim, if you're watching this. But um, this is the best prolegomena I've ever read. This is the best book. I've ever read whenever it comes to introduction of theology. And I think this came out in 2000. I can't believe how few comments or how few reviews it has on Amazon. It should have tens of thousands because it is the best. I encourage you guys to get it. It will it will break you free of a lot of the traditions. Maybe you'll go back to them, but it'll help you to understand how we have to rethink and As the reformers said, Semper Reformanda, always reforming our theology. Not only did our theology reform back in the Reformation, that some of you don't know I'm talking about because I haven't gotten there, but if you do, we reformed our theology quite a bit and moved away from the institutionalized theology of what is now called the Roman Catholic Church. We're all part of the Catholic Church, but 
what is now called the Roman Catholic Church. And whenever I say that, it's just because we're all universal. That's what Catholic means, universal. Christianity is for everybody. So um, this will help you. It will. And in folk theology, what we're doing is we're working through how to understand that sometimes we get traditions that are built into us to such a degree that we're very emotional about them and it's hard to break free but we're trying to i'm trying to give you permission to break free number one and again you may come back to it but you've got to start with this presupposition i might be wrong that's what i'm doing well you might be wrong i might be wrong Every time I study, I have to start with the supposition I might be wrong. Now, there's places that I, it's less likely for me to be wrong, but at the same time, I have to start with that supposition. And I promise you, in everything I do, I do. I do start with that supposition that I might be wrong. Now, going to uh, our PowerPoint here, let's back up just a minute, if I can, um, on the PowerPoint. And look at look at the uh, folk theology. One who can who uncritically uh, that's key word. One who uncritically constructs his or her theology uncritically, unreflectively constructs his or her theology according to traditions and folk, or religious folklore. One of the things that we do sometimes is we consume books. We love theology. You may love theology. You may not be there yet. You may have only consumed one book. But uh, we, we, whenever you get into theology, it's just you love them. I mean, you got them everywhere. They're, they're everywhere because you love books. But the, here's the deal. I had a professor, John Hanna, at Dallas Theological Seminary tell, tell us one time, he said, man, you're, you, men, you are going to read so many books while you're here in seminary. You're going to be overloaded. We overload you with stuff. We really do. It's too much work. It is too much reading. But one day, you're going to get out of here, and you're going to read a book, and I want you to go slow. I don't care about how many books you read. I care about how reflectively you read those books. And he said this, a, a theologian. My favorite theologian at Dallas Theological Seminary, he said, I want you to read less and think more. And that really influenced me. It did. Um, now, it didn't, obviously doesn't influence me to quit getting books, but it did make me think I've got to stop more often. I've got to be more careful with the, with the way I think and how I consume things. And that's what we're doing with folk theology. We're breaking free of our religious folklore one of the things that i did right before class here or before <laughs> before our podcast is um i was watching this video and it was a video i love looking at people's near-death experiences it's fascinating to me and i know it's probably fascinating to you as well it's getting bigger and bigger these days not because so many people more people are having near-death experiences but there's so many more avenues through which you can tell other people about them number one and number two the scientific community is actually starting to study near-death experiences which is pretty amazing i mean they're taking them seriously uh, uh, there are there are uh, uh, organizations out there now that uh, put together all these near death experiences and study them, and I think it's great. And you so you can go online and you can read about hundreds. I, I think right now the official number they have is two or, or maybe it's three or four hundred now near death experiences that they have studied that they've got all kinds of information about and they can they can uh, say this person really was dead and he actually confirmed something that he could not have confirmed that's the type of studies they do and there's this one where this guy goes to hell and I'm watching it right beforehand and he while he's in hell. He's talking about how you don't understand how time does not exist in hell. And you would think, everybody asked me, how much time went by while you're there? And he said, you don't understand, time doesn't exist. And the first thing I thought was, wait a minute, alarm. His experience is rubbing against my rationality. Uh, because can time cease to exist? What does that mean for time to cease to exist? 
The interesting thing is, he said, here's what happened. Okay, first they came and got me, then they took me and they ravaged me, and then they pulled me over to this other place and said, hurry up, You've got, we've got to hurry up, and I'm following them. And he's talking about being in his robe and people making fun of his, making fun of his backside in his robe. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think you said time didn't exist because you've got a before, right? Whenever you got there, before they ravaged you, then you got an after, and then you got a before you walked to this certain position, and then you got an after you walked to this certain position. Therefore, there is time in heaven. It's maybe you're perceiving it differently, but there is time. But I had to think through things. But the main thing that these near-death experiences make me think through is how does experience relate to my theology? And I say, I can't necessarily deny that this many people are having something happen after their body has ceased to function and their brain has ceased to function. So first and foremost, I look at this and I say, this shows at least that materialism is not correct. In other words, we are more than our body. And Something happens. Life continues after death. Those are the first things. But then I start reading them. And while they're all kind of the same, and there's some elements that you can look at and say, wow, these are all the same. And so this this really checks out. And it also checks out against my rationality and my understanding of the Bible. But some things just don't. Some things don't check out. Like um, like, uh, one I was listening to the other day where this guy said, uh, God told him that everybody was going to make it eventually to heaven. And I thought, wait a minute. I mean, okay, what do I do with that? Because now this guy conflicts with this guy who says that that is not true, and he had a near-death experience. And then, of course, the authority of the Bible. Where does that come in? And that's the thing we're trying to do in this class is teach you how to place everything experience emotions rationality the bible tradition all of these things have a play in our theology we're going to get to that but we've got to learn to break free and say we might be wrong so in folk theology this is what we're doing sorry to introduce that stuff with near-death theology we'll come back to some of it later on but i'm just saying there things we we've got to think we got to pull things in and systematically construct our theology in a responsible way so uh let's go back to this uh hold on just a second let's go back to our examples and last time here's where we ended right right here i think i think we ended with there we will all have new bodies in heaven uh we did talk new abilities in heaven Uh, We did talk about our all sins equal last time. I think that was the big one that may have dislodged you. I'm going to give another one here that can really that can really be effective in doing what I need to do in this first part of the theology program. And it's a different difficult one. It's another difficult one. Uh, Last time I argued, we will not have new necessarily have. We don't know really. It, just because Jesus walked through walls, and uh, it, it doesn't mean that we're going to be able to walk through walls. Why would it? All that Jesus did was appear somewhere and in his new body. And God can certainly make people appear somewhere if he wants them to, but it doesn't mean we have the ability to appear wherever we want. Um, gravity still exists in heaven, That was or in the new earth. Everything's going to be very similar to what it is now. So we move on from that and we go to God is a cosmic vending machine. That one's not that hard, but for some people it is, and I need to mention it. Because some people, whenever you become a Christian, listen, you may be a, have become a Christian. You really think God is up there to answer your prayers and get you whatever you ask for. You're going to be disappointed because not only does experience tell you that that's not true, And it will tell you that that's not true, even if you have had experience where you pray for something and you just get it, especially whenever you're a young Christian, that's, that will happen sometimes. Whenever you're a new Christian, God seems to, their testimonies across the board seem to be the same, that people are, God does little special things for you. He did a special thing for me whenever I was young. He, he, I asked him whenever I was, uh, let's see here, 
13 years old, no, 12 years old. I was 12 years old and I was at a cakewalk, <laughs> a cakewalk. You know what a cakewalk is? Maybe some of, maybe they don't even do cakewalks anymore. I don't know. They were awesome though. There was like 36, I think there was 36 or 37, 36 places where you can stand in a circle. And there were 36 people that get to be involved. And then you, then the next people, there's all these people waiting in a line to do the cakewalk. And so I get in there and they play music and you walk around the circle across all the numbers and I'm walking, you know, and I'm like, I'm not, I, you know, I believe in God. I do. I, I don't remember not believing in God when I was young or Christ. My mom taught me about Christ, brought me up in tutelage to Christianity. And I believed in it, but I, I was, you know, going through just like we all go through. And I'm, I'm thinking, um, I'm walking through this and I say, God, you know, if you're really real, help me win this cakewalk. Because, you know, I'm, I, I believe you're real, but I, if you're really real, you know, that kind of thing. If you're really actually there, and that's what you do sometimes whenever you're young. And sure enough, I won that cakewalk, and I got a cake. Okay, I've got this chocolate cake, set it aside, take that home a little bit later and eat it. And then I thought, wait a minute, maybe that was just a fluke. And so I think I'll try it again. So I got back in line and start going around the cakewalk. And I asked God again. I said, God, listen, I know that you're real, but I'm trying to check and see if you're really, really real now, because I know that you're real and you're really real because that last cakewalk, but come on, can you give me more? That might've been a, that might've been a coincidence. And so we did the cakewalk again. And this is the second time I did it. I didn't try before. I mean, this was really, this is true story. And I'm walking around the cakewalk and then they stop playing the music and I'm on the number 17. And you know what they called out? 17 and so I was like wow oh my gosh I mean I don't know what the odds are one in 36 at first but I don't know what the odds are odds are in doing it twice and so then I go and get my cake and I say well we ought to shoot this one more time you know I don't I don't know because we know he's really real he's real he's really real and now let's try to figure out if he's really 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 real (laughs) and I did it and sure enough, I, I mean, it, it's crazy. I won again. And so then I go get the cake. And then I said, one more time. Because, I mean, why stop? I mean, I'm getting cakes and stuff. And God's on my side. He's my vending machine. It seems like I've come into a whole new relationship with him. And this is pretty, pretty exciting. And so I go through again, cakewalk and... You know, I don't know what I ended up with the last time. I think I landed on 36. And guess what? That eh, wasn't. I didn't get it four times. Or four times, yeah. <laughs> but it was it was special to me. I don't know what the odds are. My son one time worked out the odds. He says they're astronomical <laughs> in me being able to do that. And um, it's funny. Listen to this. So I, t- I tell my kids that all the time. You know, I, not all the time. I tell them that some, sometime in their life. Everybody knows the cakewalk story. And so I guess they do do cakewalks today because Caitlin, my youngest, oh, she's, gosh, she's old now. She's 25 years old now, but, uh, she was my youngest one she was 13. Um, and it seems like just the other day, but it, they had a cakewalk as well. And she did the exact same thing only one time, but did the exact same thing and won it came running to me, dad, 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 God did it. I can't believe you. And then my, uh, uh, my niece who was right beside her goes and does it. And I, you're not believing me. I know you're not believing me because <laughs> this is crazy, but she won it too. And then my other daughter won it. I'm telling you, I'm telling the truth. I can get their testimony in here and they did the same thing as me because they wanted to be like dad and they couldn't believe it. And then my son goes and does it. Okay. One of my sons, my other son wasn't old enough yet. And he goes and does it. And he's the only one who did not get a cake. He he felt, he's like, no dad, it didn't work for me. And it worked for everybody else. I felt so bad for him. I mean, it was horrible. I was like, God, why, 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 you know, (laughs) why would you do this to my son? But um, anyway, that's all to illustrate how we automatically begin to try God out, see if he is a cosmic vending machine, to see if it will work that we can get whatever we want. And sometimes we get built up in our perception 
that that's the way God is, especially whenever we are a Christian who has not gone through the ringer of life and troubles and praying to God for something over and over and over again, praying to God for good things in our lives, whether it be for, you know, good relationship or, or to get rid of depression or, or to not have anxiety or, or to be able to pay bills. And it doesn't happen. And that, that in invariably for all of us, we go through that suffering and we come to this picture of us as, as, of we come to this picture we have of God as a cosmic vending machine and we say well is he a cosmic vending machine and we say you know what he's not he can't be and then we have to question ourselves and say is our theology did our, did our, did our life and faith just fall apart because we had God as a cosmic vending machine well yes in one sense it did in one sense that faith was misplaced and we begin either to walk away from God because our perception of who he is is not winding out to be true. He doesn't let us win all the cakewalks, and he may not let us win any cakewalks. Um, and we begin to walk away from that. Or we begin to reformulate our, our beliefs about God, and we begin to look to the sources, other sources besides experience. I'm not saying experience is not a source. That was very special to me, that cakewalk. It was, and I believe it was God. I've had one other miracle in my life, and I know that sounds weird. The cakewalk was one of them because I don't know how that happened. There's one other. I don't want to talk about it right now. Maybe I'll maybe I'll bring it up some other time, but it's it's a very difficult one for me to talk about. But it was a miracle. It absolutely was a miracle. But God is not a cosmic vending machine. I have found that out in different ways, and so have you if you've been a Christian a long time. Okay, so that is a folk theology that we sometimes have. Now, let's look at this next one. Where two or or three are gathered in his name, he is present in prayer. Have you ever heard that before? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst before you. That is a passage from Scripture, from Matthew. And... You may have, this is, this disturbs somebody, maybe not as bad as some of these others, but maybe it does. But I want to tell you something real quick that, that where two or three are gathered in my name has nothing to do with prayer at all. It doesn't, um, we sometimes get in circles and we pray and you probably have said this before, or you may have heard somebody say this before, but you're holding hands and they see you say something like, God, you promise to be with us whenever two or three are gathered. And here we are with many people. And so therefore we are invoking that promise to be with us. Now, you may not think that God is going to do anything special because that, but you think there is something special happening whenever you have two or three gathered in his name. Well, that is part of, again, our evangelical folklore. It may go beyond evangelicalism. I don't know. But within evangelicalism, you'll hear this all the time. I hear it all the time whenever I'm gathered together in prayer with other people. And they'll say it. I'm not going to jump all over them and say, hey, you're wrong. That passage does not talk about prayer. I'm just going to say, hey, you know, let's just, I, I kind of peek with my eye open and say, look around, see if anybody else notices. No, I don't. But it's it's not about prayer. And let me show you something. We're going to go to the Bible and look at the context of this particular passage. Um, look, look, look here, this is, uh, in Matthew chapter 18 and it says, where'd it go? Where's if two, one or two or three are gathered, um, for where there, can you see this? Yeah. Okay. For where there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am with them. That's where we get it. Matthew, Matthew 18, 20. However, some of you know what I'm going to say, and you know what I'm talking about here. In the context, this particular passage has nothing to do with prayer. It has to do with church discipline. Now, let me back up for a second and ask you, if we do say that, if 
God is with us where two or three are gathered. Let me ask you a couple questions. Number one, is it two or is it three? And if you go above three, is that okay? I know, I know. You may say, no, no, Michael, that's just kind of an idiom that says where there's many people, where there's many people gathered in my name. And okay, I'll agree with you. I think it's kind of funny because that's the way the Bible talks, where two or three, you know, yea, it's it's six, six sins do I hate. Yea, no, it's seven. <laughs> There's always kind of this poetic way to say it, where two or three are gathered in my name. Well, um, but having said that, that's not about prayer. Uh, and if it is, if it is, let me ask you this question. If you are praying alone, does that mean God is not with you? Is that what you're telling people? Whenever you're in that circle and you have somebody that's maybe doesn't know that much about prayer, just learning about it, if they hear you say, God, you, were, you promised to be with us if two or three are gathered and in your name, and here we are. So be with us in that special way. Are you telling the person who's by themselves that whenever they pray by themselves, God is not there? You might say, no, no, Michael, that's not what I'm saying. It's just, you know, kind of a special thing. So he's not there specially. Well, no, no, Michael, it's it's just, you know, there's more power in it. So there's not power whenever you're praying by yourself. You see, I mean, all these theological implications you're handing over to people based upon this. And I, I bet you, I bet you if you do use that prayer in, the, in that, whenever you, if you do say that in prayer, you probably haven't thought through what it's about. I don't mean to jump all over you. I'm really not trying to. I'm just trying to dislodge you, and maybe this will disturb you enough to help you understand what I'm talking about. Now, let's go back to the passage of Scripture and show what it is really about. Um, here we go. Now, we go to um, verse 15. If your brother or sister sins go and point out their fault just between the two of you if they listen to you you have won your brother over so first we know we are talking about church discipline right here let's see if it keeps on in the same context but here's the deal in church discipline whenever somebody let, let, let's well really it's just in personal relationships let's keep it that way right now in personal relationships if somebody does you wrong that we what god tells you to do first before anything else is keep it private isn't that interesting god wants us to keep it private it says um go to them your brother and to go to them and point out their fault just between the two of you, not in public, not on the internet. You do not announce things. You want to deal with them privately because God, God doesn't want to shame anybody right off the bat. He wants you to work through this. And so here we are. We two people, and whenever somebody sends, you go to them by yourself and talk to them. What happens if they don't listen? If but if they will not listen, take two others along with you so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, you see what is going on here is you have God going back to the Old Testament, the way in which all matters, I mean, this is just very practical, all matters need to be settled is kind of with more people, okay? You go to somebody and say, listen, you were wrong to do that to me. And they say, no, I wasn't. You got to understand I was, uh, here's the reasons why I didn't. And you know, you're, you have an argument, you have a serious disagreement. And then you say, hey, listen, will you come over here and listen to this? And hey, will you come over here and listen to this and see what you guys think? That's the idea. You're bringing people into the conversation. You're not bringing your wingmen you know, sometimes that's what we do. I'll go get a couple of people that already agree with me, and then we'll get you. No, that's not what it's about. It's about bringing in two other neutral witnesses that can listen to the case between you guys and decide, help decide. This is what we are to do as Christians. Neutral people, neutral people. I'm telling you, if it's not neutral, it doesn't make any difference. You are not following this. It is not, you are not doing what the Lord says to do in time, in times where there is 
substantial disagreement, problems, uh, relationship problems, whatever else it is going on. And so you bring the two or three people together, and then it says, listen to this, here we go. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. So here we go. If the, if this is assuming those two or three you brought with you up here do agree with you and say all three of you are saying, dude, you're wrong, you got it wrong, this guy is right. So, you know, say you're sorry. I mean, change. Do whatever is necessary to resolve this situation because you were at fault. And if the person still says, I'm not at fault, then you bring it to the congregation. And in this situation, it is it says the church. And so this is a situation where you're bringing Christians together, probably the pastor and people of authority at this point, an elder, however your authority system works at your church, but you say, hey, will you listen to this? And you bring it to the church, and then the church says, yep, you're wrong. That's the assumption here. The church agrees with you, does not agree with them, because if they agree with them, we don't have to go to the next step. But the church says, uh, you're wrong if they still refuse to listen. I mean, tell it to the church. And if they still refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Okay, this is where you say, hey, listen, we just can't be in this relationship anymore. It's not working out. It's too hard on me. And I know you've done wrong. Other people, neutral people have come in. And then even the neutral bigger congregation or, or elders within our church have said that. So you're still not repenting. So at this point, I have to move away. I have to, uh, you have to be away from me. That's the idea. You have to be away from us, this situation, because you are unrepentant and you've done something very, very wrong to us. And then... What is the situation? It says, truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? What, is the, what does that mean? That means whenever you get together in this situation, under God, in prayer, in, in doing it right, neutral, everything that I've said, that whenever you do this, the, what this means is that you have the authority in this situation of God. It doesn't mean you're infallible. You still could be, everybody still could be wrong. And I've seen situations where the one guy who keeps on saying, no, no, you don't understand, he ends up being right. But in this situation, okay, the way God has set it up in the church is that, generally speaking, these the group is going to be right even though there's exceptions. And in that situation, the group has authority. Well, how do you know he has authority? Well, let's go back. Again, I truly tell you, if two if uh, two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, well, what, what, what are we talking about here? We're not talking about prayer. We're talking about this situation of church discipline. It will be done for them by my father. For, now we're finally to this verse, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with you. So this is simply talking about in the, in the presence of church discipline, whenever you have, whenever you've done it right, whenever you've done it right, you have God with you. His authority is with you. Again, doesn't mean infallibility. It just means his authority is with you. And that is great. I mean, what a great thing to have right here. But it is not about prayer. That's what I'm trying to do. Now, does that really dislodge you? I don't know. I think it's a good example. It's a good way in which we misunderstand things and it becomes part of our folklore. You may have gotten very angry at some of these, like with, with all sins being equal. You may have said, Michael, I don't care that you say all sins are not equal. Because I know that they are. Because I've heard it so many times and it sounds great. You see, what will end up happening is you get very, people get folk theologians, whatever. Your, your, your intent on holding on to your folk theology because you've always held on to it. All The only recourse you have is your emotions. Because the arguments are not there. The, the, the arguments are not there. You can't, you can't justify it just by saying 
it's true because it's always been true. It's true. My theology is true because my parents taught it to me. It's true because I, I, I remember as a little kid believing in this, and I believe in it all the way until now. And let me tell you something. I've never doubted it, and I'm not going to start doubting it now. Well, there's nothing much we can do. I mean, if you can't move past this point, I pro- I'm being very serious here at this point. If you cannot move past this point in your theology, it's no use going forward. Don't worry about the rest. Because all you're going to do, all you're going to allow me to do, all you're allow, going to allow anybody teaching you to do is confirm your prejudice. And let me tell you something. I know people like this, and so do you. You may be a person like this. I'm not trying to come down on you too hard. I'm really not. I'm just trying to say, join, join us on this mission to... Make better people out of ourselves. That's what theology is about. It's not about knowing more. It's not about, uh, you know, be, having the big words. It's about coming before God and loving him with all your mind. It's about coming before God. And as Jeremiah says, God says to us, don't let the person rejoice that he has big army or lots of money or, or anything like that. Don't, that's not what you rejoice about. You rejoice in what? Let him who rejoice rejoice in this, that he understands and knows me. And this is what we're doing. Anytime you try to understand the world, anything in this world, whenever we are a Christian, everything is God's. Everything is a product of him. Everything is from him. And no matter what you discover, no matter what you see, whether it's music or automobiles or technology or uh in this space and the stars, everything is God's, and we put it in that context. And we want to understand things as well as we can, as well as we can, and we want to do things right, have the right methodology about understanding them, because whenever we understand them, we are beginning to understand God. Let him who rejoice rejoice in this. And theology is all about that passage, rejoicing and understanding and knowing him. And I hope... I have been able to, during this folk theology section, convince you. I mean, there's more. Just like like Paul says over here, uh, uh, Revelation 3, 20, it is. There's an emotional response to that. Check that out. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. If you go to my blog and look for folk folk theology, I think I have it both on Patreon and on credohouse.org. But look up folk theology and look up C. Michael Patton or Credo House in a web browser, and I guarantee this blog will come up first. And I got a list of things that might disturb you. Okay, it's bigger than this list, I think, and a little bit more harsh. And it would take me a long time to get through that entire list, but I'm just bringing up a few examples of folk theology so that you can look at these things and say, gosh, maybe I need a change. Maybe I need to read the prologue to this book and before I move forward. doesn't mean you're wrong about everything. It doesn't mean that I'm smarter than you. Are. That's None of that stuff is what I'm saying. All I'm saying is it's a right methodology and let's get a right methodology because we want to glorify God, not just with what we believe, but how we believe it. You see, it's not just why we believe it. It's how we believe it. How do you believe And we believe through responsible methodology as we move forward. Okay, guys, listen. I've gone way over this time. I I hope I have convinced you of this. And I hope you're going to keep on coming back. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you're subscribing. I hope you're commenting everywhere because that's how I hear the algorithms work. You you have to comment and rate and that kind of stuff. So if you you want to, do it. Um, Also, if you will, this would be great, too. You become a well. That didn't work. <laughs> you become a patron at uh, at at patreon.com forward slash c michael patton patreon.com forward slash c michael patton. That's the place to go. I would love for you to have 
to support this. This is the way I make a living. It really is. It's the only way I make a living. I've been doing ministry for 23 years in such a way. This is the new avenue for it, but it would be great to have your support. But also, we give away so much free stuff if you become a member of Patreon, and so that is really cool. I'm going to try also, I'm going to try on the Discord server for my patron members, if you go to Discord and search up Credo House, you'll have an automatic membership to that Discord server, and I'm going to get on there and discuss. Let's see if there's anybody there. There may not be anybody, but I'm going to keep on trying to do this because we'll have an after-class discussion each time. So don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to comment, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us.